And my name is Sally Timms. And my name is John Langford. And we play in the Mekongs. Well, I was in a band called the Sheehees, which was this all women kind of semi joke band. Semi joke. Well, some of it was okay. That was a complete joke. I don't know. And uh, we used to sing these uh, very stupid country songs that we wrote ourselves. It was just mockery of country before I gained an appreciation of it properly. And, and John. The AstroTurf was a good song. It was a good song. But then uh, John suggested that I make a country record. So he um, pushed me into doing that. Forster, pushed her, Forster. Forster, against my will. Yeah. I, the, the thing I'd done prior to that, I made a record with Pete Shelley when I was about 19, but that was more like an experimental record. And so I never really thought I was going to be a singer. And yet, because of the kind of cultural environment at the time, everyone was playing in bands. So I, I was in but, this women's band and then... The no, Mekons before you had the shoes, you sang on a Mekons... And I sang once on a Mekons track. On a Mekons record, track, yeah. where we discovered you could sing. It was a yes. surprise. And then, uh, so I made this country record and uh, then after that, slowly, I started doing a bit more for the Mekons and became a full-time member in the late 80s. It was 87. So he said we went, we did a tour of the States and Eric couldn't come. So me and Tom decided Sally was going to come. So she dyed her hair white for some reason. And, we and took looked it. like a gnome. You looked like a, yeah. Very looked like a garden gnome and came to America for the first yeah. time. Yeah. So I was, I really got interested in country music around 83. And that was Terry Nelson. He was a DJ in town. He still does a show on WLUW and he's a good friend of ours. When we first came to Chicago, we kind of, looked after us and put our gigs on. But uh, he he made me a bunch of cassettes in about 1983 of Hank Williams, not Hank Williams, no, more, more George Jones, Merle Haggard, Ernest Tubb, Jerry D. Lewis, the classic kind of honky-tonk country stuff. And uh, we just we just got really excited by that because we hadn't really heard good country music before. And there were these, um, I mean, it's quite strange <laughs> Even in London, there were these little pubs where people would go and reenact kind of shootouts dressed as cowboys. Do you remember that? those? And they well, had in them. Leeds, yeah. there was a post office social the post office social club. It was for postal workers, which is kind of frightening considering the history of postal workers in America. <laughs> but in Leeds, they'd meet this big working men's club on a, on a Wednesday night, and you'd go down there, and they'd have like. Well, everyone would be dressed up. They'd have shootouts. They'd have a country band. It was just fantastic. They do kind of line dancing. They do line dancing, and yeah. they'd have like competition for best Mexican. You know, there'd be one bloke who dress as a Mexican with a big sombrero, and he'd win every week. And then they'd have a raffle where you could win stuff. And we'd go in, and if you won the raffle, they'd all look at you like you're totally shit. You know, because you come in. Because you were an interloper. Because you're an interloper, yeah. and you come and won their raffle. But there was like this. It really odd subculture of um, like people who were into American country or that, that, that culture. Oh, well, uniform, yeah. you know. Yeah. And the music, though. Yeah. yeah. And this kind of loopy little interpretation of what cowboys and well, cowboys So we were into that, and then we came to the States, and we, you know, we were looking for country, country music in the States. We turn the radio on, and there's nothing on that resembles country music. And it's like it's all in the past and no one knows anything about it. And then we stumbled after a Mekon show. I think it was at the Cubby Bear in 87. We went down to the Sundowners Ranch uh, on Randolph Street. And we'd all been to Alcala's that day and bought, well, you worked. <laughs> and we bought a load of like shirts and cowboy hats. And we walk into this, you know, proper redneck country and western bar in Chicago. And, uh, the band are just delighted as we walked in. They started going, oh, looks like we got a band here. you got to guys come up and play. What are you going to play? We're like, no, no, we don't play. We're not going to get it. And they I would, did. They insisted. We got yeah. up We got up and we played. And I sang Long Black Veil, I think. It was the first yeah. time. I don't know what we did the first time. Yeah. It was a disaster. And the but other, they didn't seem to care. They did not care. They loved it. And then I made a point of thinking about it. And I'm going to go back there and I'm going to get up there and nail a song, do it properly. And so I learned some Johnny Cash songs big Johnny Cash fan, but that was amazing, you know, those, those guys. And that, that whole 
for us, for me anyway, that you know, as that whole link with Chicago and hillbilly culture is this sort of ongoing kind of thing that's still revealing itself to me because um, you know, it was bloodshot, so I came here and said, that's weird, a country label in Chicago, and it's not weird at all because the WLS band dance was here, and then all those clubs, there was tons and tons of clubs um, going back, you know, through the 60s, and then, you know, and then, and then just recently we've been discovering all this sort of radical history of like poor, you know, poor southern white people who moved back up to Chicago, moved up to Chicago, and how they organized, you know, and united with like the Black Panthers and Puerto Rican street gangs in the late 60s. It's very interesting culture and, a, a, and a, a history that you're not really supposed to know about. Yeah. Steve, Steve moved here, he got married. <coughs> And in about 88, Chicago. I think that was quite early on. I moved here in 91, 92. Um, I moved to New York first, and then I came here in about 97. No, I got, 94, we're doing, no. gave me Memphis. Well, that's, no, I moved doing, here. The street from Memphis. From, I moved here in 97. Okay. I no and idea. I got married. So we all basically got here because In we the Mekons movie, there's a very funny bit where Sally says, Sally says, oh, well, we won't move to Chicago because... People, it was easy to find sexual partners because people seemed to have very low standards. And I, I was sat next to my wife at the Lincoln well, she Hall. She obviously does have low watching, standards. Watching this movie, and then she, <laughs> Sally was sat the other side of it, and she punched me. And I said, I didn't say that. She no, she's punch just you. punching you because she's disappointed in how because it turned so, out. Oh, it was revealed to her. She, yeah, she realizes now that it was, it's you know, true, the standards yeah. were too, she'd set the bar too low. I know. Yeah, and probably, she ended up with you. Probably agonizes of that. Yeah. Yeah. What can you do? I set the bar too low too. Good. <laughs> we all did. Anyway, sorry. That's why we ended up in that. Sexual intercourse brought us to Chicago. I came Along here in 85 with the Three Johns and it was, we did this crazy tour where we flew everywhere and it was just, four of us with guitars and a drum machine and we bounced around the whole country and it was just it was pretty pretty exhausting and crazy and at the end of the tour we ended up in Chicago and then they said do you want to just stay here for a few days and we stayed with some people mm -hmm. like in a house and we went to shops and bought food and sat in a garden and it was just yeah. like really Chicago was something like oh wow you know we loved LA and New there, York. There's and a reason it, we came but here. But it was, I mean, it was just, the, it, it, it felt very much like the north of England to yeah. me, you know. It, it was very, very supportive. And, and there were tons of people moving here then. I mean, it was kind of band central. Everyone was coming in eight, late 80s, 90s, because it was cheap. It's central. You know, labels set themselves up here. Our label was here. Agencies were here. There were so many supportive venues. I mean, I lived in New York for five years. And it was nothing like it was here. You know, there it was far more competitive and people didn't really, I mean, you know, there's great people there, but it wasn't what it was here. Here it was just very, very collaborative. People wanted to make things, they wanted to do things with you, you know. I can't imagine going up to a band who were like Tortoise in New York and saying, will you play on our record? Because they'd be too snooty, but here, you know, a band like Tortoise, the people they were, they would say, of course, you know, so there was this whole thing where there wasn't that big division between musicians, everyone just pitched in and then we had... And there was all sorts of different styles of music yeah. here as well. When Bloodshot started, it was, you know, they, they'd heard Fear and Whiskey, which came out in like 1985. And to be honest, you know, we were kind of over that a bit at, the, at that point. And the stuff we were making with the Mekons wasn't really anything like that, but... They sort of said, would you write a country song? We're doing an alternative country record. And would you write a song? So I was like, and then, we, you know, we started doing the Waco Brothers, but it was all kind of people, other people suggesting things. And that, that never happened to me in England when I was living in Leeds. You'd have to do it yourself and sort of then try and push the idea down throat, someone's throat. But in America, it just seemed like there was all this, literally was, you know, a kind of land of opportunity for us. I mean, Bloodshot started in 94 and we're still putting records out on Bloodshot and we were 15 years with Touch and Go, which was, you know, a fantastic experience, really. That was like a, for the Mekons, a band that had such a crazy, you know, relationship with the music business to have 15 years in a kind of safe harbor where people supported you and let you do what you wanted to do was remarkable.
We'll a play selection a song. We'll of play things. a song off Jura. Yeah, we went to Scotland with Robbie Fox and we made this record called Jura uh, on a large island with very few people on it. On called the West Jura. Beach, called Jura. And we drank a lot of whiskey called Jura. Jura. And we made a little <laughs> film about it called Jura. Yeah. And uh, so that just came out on Bloodshot. And um, we're going to do a song from that. We're going to do a song from Ancient and Modern, which is the last Mekons record. Are we? Oh, yeah. Gishi. Oh, yeah, we are. And a song from Natural, which is the previous Mekons record. Yes. So we're staying very and up to date. Yeah. And then one extra bonus track, which no one will ever hear. OK. <laughs> We were in the studio on Saturday. I'm, I'm in a menopausal Maoist collective with Janet Bean called Moxie Tongue. And John does all the backing tracks and we sing lyrics like A Hundred Fascists Must Die and uh, How to Kill Bankers. And there's just the two of us. We have really good dance routines. And that is my uh, one of my major interests right now. We were editing and kind of finishing up a Mekon's record we made. We did a tour in the summer and we recorded an album in one night in Brooklyn at a little theatre called Jalopy and it was in front of an audience but the audience weren't an audience they were actually participants and they weren't they weren't allowed to clap at the end of the songs and yeah it wasn't like a live recording no, it's the, it was a studio session with the audience participating they sang on the record and, and they paid to get yeah. in so it's a new business model where we it's actually excellent. the album went into profit before it had even been made Good which boy. is a brand new idea for us so uh, but well, we, very innovative. There's only a couple of mics as well, so it's not. It's really easy to mix it. So we were sort of sitting around the other day, just going, uh, make it sound weirder, make it sound. And and the concept. Make it is, sound less yeah, weird. Make it less, less weird. We're going to actually put it out as a book, DVD, and record in one package. So that's the idea. We'll there see if it go. happens. So we're working on that. Well, it's so American. It's so foreign to yes. us. I mean, it's, we'll it's such a, it's a kind of a, I like the, all these levels of it, you know, like the clothes, the uniform you have, you know, you can put by a cowboy shirt, a cowboy hat, and suddenly you're, a, you're part of this weird culture. And uh, actually, Terry Nelson, the thing he said to us was, the Mekons, you know, you're not like a punk band, you don't sing about anarchy all the time, and all that, you sing about bars, drinking in bars and failed sexual relationships. That's, you're more like a country band, and your songs are really simple, just three chords. You're like a country band, and we were saying, that's absolutely ridiculous, you know. Can't imagine what he's mm -hmm. talking about. And then we listened to, like I said, Merle Haggard, George Jones, Ernest Tubb, some of that stuff, from the sort of golden age of country music, when it was, it was music that kind of really sang, connected directly with its audience, and it connected on all these weird levels with sort of real people's lives, and it confronted reality kind of head on and it was I loved all the drinking cheating killing songs you know <laughs> it was, it was, I, I just do it because I'm quite good at singing it but I was never a particular country fan so I can't claim a big interest in it you know, I, I, I keep coming yeah. back to it as well to be honest it's it's you know it's white it's white blues you know and a lot of the country music you listen to it's not country at all it's like it's really urban the things they're talking about in the songs are about people working in factories and they might be pining for the country, but it's about a, it's about an urban experience a lot of the time, and it's a very I find it very inclusive music because I've heard country music all over the world. Like we said, there's post office social club up in Leeds, there's people. Or well, Jimmy Roger. Yeah. Jimmy Roger in in Africa. In Africa, people love Jimmy Roger, and I then mean, we. I, I got he's to, a little fawn. I produced an album yeah. for a guy called Roger Knox in uh, Australia, and he's an Aboriginal tribal leader and a big big kind of time protest singer and that's that's his medium his country music and he listened to country music when he was a he was a kid and uh, the aboriginal people tell the, the story of their terrible oppression through country music because it's fantastic for telling stories 